This is Join Us in France, episode 181. Join Us in France is the podcast where we talk about France, its many quirks, its history, its language, and of course, destinations in France you want to learn about, because hopefully you'll be visiting soon. Bonjour, I'm Annie Sargent, and on today's episode, I'm going to tell you about The Hunchback of Notre Dame, the novel by Victor Hugo. Whenever I am at Notre Dame, I like to imagine Quasimodo climbing the facade of the cathedral, Esmeralda dancing on the esplanade, the gargoyles singing, and Frollo being evil. But of course, that's not quite the story Victor Hugo told. The story has been retold many times, most notably in a Disney movie in 1996. If you remember the story at all, that's probably the one that stuck in your mind. And it wasn't particularly faithful to the Victor Hugo story. It's still a good movie of its own right. It's visually stunning. The music is great. But if you're preparing a trip to France, I think you'll be glad to know about the original story because it reveals a lot about French society and how it worked in the late Middle Ages when the story takes place. Many tour guides will tell you that Victor Hugo single-handedly saved Notre Dame Cathedral from a sure destruction. While I think that might be a slight exaggeration, the uncomfortable truth is that Notre Dame was in terrible disrepair after the French Revolution. The revolution was hard on all religious buildings, and in particular convents and monasteries. Groups of nuns and monks were threatened, many of them killed, their orders disbanded. The buildings were turned over to military groups or even opened for everyone and anyone to take over. The novel, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, was first published in 1831. When it came out, most of the critics loved it. There were a few curmudgeons who did like it. I'm looking at you, Balzac. But readers loved historical fiction and it became necessary to do a second edition within a few months of the first one. The novel is set in the late 1400s, right there in Paris, a place that was familiar to readers and yet taking on almost magical capabilities. What a popular great book can do is turn people's attention to a topic they had been ignoring thus far. The people of Paris around 1830 knew that Notre Dame was in shambles because they could see it. They knew that during the revolution, the cathedral was looted and that the people of Paris not only stole everything they could, but they used what they stole to put on plays to make fun of religion on the public square. Notre Dame was renamed the Temple of Reason and they forced clergy to perform secular rituals that were based on church rituals, just making fun of belief. It was so extreme that Robespierre himself wanted to put an end to it and declared that the people had to have the freedom of religion. Two of the stranger things that happened at Notre Dame were that it was used as a wine storage facility and also at other times as a saltpeter factory. What's a saltpeter factory, you ask? Well, saltpeter is a crucial ingredient to make cannon powder, and the revolutionaries were leading both a civil war and a war against other European powers, so they needed plenty of saltpeter. To give you the 10-second summary, saltpeter is scraped off wet, bad plaster walls. Humid basements have saltpeter. They ask people to scrape the stuff off of their cellars and to bring it to Notre Dame where it could be allowed to dry and be packaged to be used in the war effort. 
The people could see the broken statues. They could see that the roof is deteriorating, that the stained glass windows were broken, that the floors were torn up. Things turned around for the cathedral in 1802 when the keys were given back to the custodian of the building and he was able to control comings and goings. Repairs happened slowly, but people didn't come to the rescue of Notre Dame en masse until the novel woke enough people up to the urgency and the need to reclaim the church as part of our heritage and make it whole again. But eventually, they got there, thankfully. Now, let me tell you about the novel and why it was so popular. Victor Hugo was a literary genius, to me on the same level as Charles Dickens. They were contemporaries, both born in the early 1800s. But Victor Hugo died at age 83, whereas Dickens died of a stroke at age 58. They both wrote during the Romantic period and both wrote within the same genre, historical fiction. They wrote about poor people and the human condition. To me, the biggest difference between Hugo and Dickens is that Hugo drives his plots with character flaws instead of events that happen in the world. For example, Victor Hugo put in play a judge who happens to be deaf and desperate to hide that fact. Then, by a whole series of comical misunderstandings that I'll get back to in a minute, due to being deaf and in denial, that leads to Esmeralda being condemned to death for a crime she didn't commit. So, at first, you laugh about the deaf judge, who is such a fool, and then you realize in horror where that's going to lead. Hugo also writes counterintuitive thieves that are obsessed with following arbitrary rules that they set between themselves. That also leads to funny situations, but the thieves are often more moral than the judges. And, you know, it seems to me that Dickens writes judges that behave like judges and thieves that behave like thieves. What drives the plot with Dickens is that there are events that happen outside of the protagonist's control, but people behave more or less according to their rank and place in society. Well, Hugo does not follow that convention, and that's how he surprised a lot of average readers who got a good laugh every few pages. But I have to face up to the fact that years ago, I tried to read the complete edition in paperback, and I soon gave up. I can't remember why I gave up, but the size of the book alone probably scared me. It's 733 pages. So this time, I went for the abridged version on Audible, so the audiobook, and I got it in French because... Well, French is my native tongue, and I enjoy works in the original language better anyway. The French abridged version is read by an actor called André Dussolier. It's a pleasure to listen to. It's really engaging. I really, really enjoyed the book. But if French isn't your native tongue, should you try it in French? Well, let's put it this way. For those of you who are Patreon supporters, if you can understand lunch break French easily without following along with a text, you might do fine with this audiobook, but it's advanced French, be warned. I think it's better to read an abridged version in English than not read it at all or not listen to it at all. So that, you know, that's my take on it. So what's in the novel Notre Dame de Paris or The Hunchback of Notre Dame? I'm going to tell you the actual original story as Victor Hugo wrote it. I will skip several parts because it's so long, but I won't completely change the story like Disney did. So if you know the Disney version called The Hatchback of Notre Dame, you'll notice some big differences. But if you're coming to Paris with your kids and they know the Disney story, I think it might be good to watch it again. They'll be glad to see the actual cathedral where most of the movie takes place. And you should take them up to the tower where 
Quasim- Quasimodo spent most of his life. And I must say that Disney did a good job rendering Notre Dame visually. The story takes place, like I said, around 1480, and the stone at Notre Dame was not cleaned up. Uh, It hadn't been restored to its original beauty until the middle of the 1800s, so Disney was correct to show it as a dark gray cathedral. When you go today, late in the afternoon, if it's a sunny day, the stone looks creamy yellow and i'll put pictures of that on joinusinfrance.com for slash 181 but the people who lived in the 1400s never saw it like that ever you know so disney also shows a crowded space in front of the cathedral which is how it was until the late uh, 1800s so they got many things right And they deliberately changed other things for the purposes of telling their story. And like I said, it's a, it's a work of it in its own right. And it's a, it's a fine movie. Um, yeah, just different. So now let me tell you about the plot, the book. The book opens with the election of the Pope of Fools. And that's when you meet Quasimodo. Various people are trying to make the ugliest face they can through a contraption that only shows their face. Then Quasimodo appears, and he's clearly the ugliest thing anybody has ever seen. People are in awe of how ugly he is. A true freak who is clearly freaked out by what's happening around him. Everybody is stunned when they realize that this is really his face. He wasn't even trying to make faces. Later on in the book, we meet a poet named Gringoire and a thief called Clopin. Clopin begged from Gringoire that very day, and Gringoire refused to give him anything. So Gringoire is condemned to hang to death for being too different from present company. But if one of the women in the room wants him, he'll go free with his new bride. A fat woman comes up and she doesn't want him because he's not rich enough. An old black woman comes up and she finds him too skinny. A fine young lady comes up and takes a look at him and he really begs her to take him, but she's capricious and she says no. Then... Just as they were about to hang him, in comes Esmeralda, the gorgeous gypsy woman who takes pity on him and says she will marry him. She only marries him to save him. Her heart is already taken, but she can't stand to see a perfectly good man hung for no reason. The third part of the book is a lovely, lovely description of Notre Dame Cathedral and a scathing indictment of the renovation work done by anybody ever. (laughs) Uh, If parts of the cathedral were broken, Victor Hugo believed in replacing them with the exact same thing. Actually, that's very much what the folks who maintain Notre Dame today are doing, But for a long time, architects tried to improve Notre Dame by adding this or that, and he lists several unfortunate additions in the book. And Viollet-le-Duc did even more in the middle 1800s. I'll put a link to an old translation of that part of the book. For those of you who want to read it, uh, that'll be on joinusinfrance.com forward slash 181. Victor Hugo clearly knew a lot about architecture, about Gothic architecture and Notre Dame in particular. And you know what? Going back to the episode I did last week about the Gallery of Kings, Victor Hugo says that the Gallery of Kings represents the kings of France and not the kings of Judah. So the revolutionaries were not the only ones who thought that. This is also where we learn that Frollo is obsessed with the idea that cathedrals tell stories in stone and that the book would supplant the cathedral by telling stories in words and not in stone. 
architecture was the universal language before the printing press came to be, and Frollo is worried about that. But, you know, Frollo's prediction came true. Very few people today can read the stories told in stones on cathedrals. But, of course, we also have many new ways to learn new things that would blow his mind. So, you know, he was worried about books. What would he have to say about podcasts? (laughs) So... Worrying about new technologies is something that every generation does. For example, did you know that the f- one of the fundamental tenets of the Druid religion in Brittany was that knowledge could not be written down? They figured if something is written down, then the knowledge can be stolen. So don't write it. Make people memorize everything. So people who wanted to become druids needed to spend 20 years memorizing things. So by the time they were old enough to have, you know, the knowledge to be a druid, so say they um, grow up for seven or eight years and then they go 20 years in school, by the time they were ready to be productive, they would be around 28 or 30 years old. Is it any wonder that their civilization died out so fast? The fourth part of the book is a flashback to the day when Quasimodo was abandoned as a baby and left in the spot inside of Notre Dame Cathedral where that sort of business was conducted. So people would come by during Sunday Mass, drop off a baby, and the parishioners knew that the babies were free to a good home, you know, like cats today, you know, free to a good home kind of thing. I listened to a fascinating radio interview with a historian who, uh, she researched foundling children in Paris and she was really fascinating and she wrote a book. So I'll certainly do an episode about that uh, at some point. But on the day Quasimodo was abandoned, dozens of people were perusing the new babies, but he got all the attention because of what he looked like. That part of the book, I must say, is gripping because the people have never met such a deformed child. And he wasn't abandoned as a baby. He's actually an underfed four-year-old, the author tells us. So some people are really frightened at the sight of him. Some donate money to feel less heartless for being horrified. But the old widows who normally handle founding children decide that maybe they should make a big fire and kill him. The description Victor Hugo gives us is amazing, and you really think they're going to kill that baby. But a young priest has been looking over the scene, and he announces that he will adopt the baby. He is described as austere, already losing his hair, and with deep-set eyes. Victor Hugo doesn't give any hints as to why, But the priest takes the child, puts him in his robes, and walks off without giving any explanation. The priest baptizes his adoptive child and names him Quasimodo. That's a name he made up. But quasi means almost, and modo means either human or newborn, depending on the context. So he's either quasi, he's either quasi human or quasi newborn, you know, which. I guess you could argue that he is both. Then the story jumps 12 years to when Quasimodo is 16 and he is now the bell ringer at Notre Dame. His whole world is within the walls of the cathedral, which he almost never leaves. Quasimodo is one with the church. He can climb the walls like a lizard. The cathedral is his world and his shell. And because he starts ringing the bells at age 14, he loses his hearing by age 16. Now the hunchback only has one eye. He walks funny, yet he is very agile in his familiar environment. He becomes deaf and he decides not to speak anymore. And he is so ugly that people recoil at the sight of him. But Frollo taught Quasimodo how to read and write. But really, he's happiest with the gargoyles and the chimera who look upon him with a favorable eye because he's monstrous just like they are, yet he is alive. 
And this is where the book and the movie differ completely. Here, Frollo is portrayed as a kind man and Quasimodo as a mean person. Quasimodo has become mean because he grew up to be almost wild and the world has been so mean to him. And Quasimodo is as strong as a horse, which scares people. The only people who don't make fun of him are the kings and the saints made of stone that he knows so well. The gargoyles and the chimera don't scare him because they look like him and he talks to them. Quasimodo loves two things above all, his bells and his adoptive father, Claude Frollo. Quasimodo is grateful for his father and he hangs on his every word and every wish. Frollo is serious and stern, but treats Quasimodo fairly. Then a new chapter opens with Quasimodo in shackles. He is brought before a judge. Vague accusations that included trying to kidnap somebody. Now, this is the foolish judge that I told you about at the beginning. The judge is almost completely deaf, and he has spent many years trying to hide that fact. So when the judge asks a question, he knows that the defendant is going to answer, right? So the clerk writes the answers, even though the judge has no idea what was just said. And then the judge knows, okay, I move on to the next question. But when the deaf judge questions Quasimodo, who is also deaf, Quasimodo answers nothing, and the judge doesn't realize that no words were spoken. At one point, the judge asks if the clerk has been able to write down all the answers, and of course, everybody in the room bursts out laughing because Quasimodo still hasn't said anything. So Quasimodo has no idea what's happening, and he, he decides to answer the next question by saying his name. But really, the judge was asking him why he was brought in. So, more hilarity in the room. Eventually, the judge gets so angry that he passes a cruel sentence and Quasimodo is going to be whipped. And Victor Hugo describes the torture in detail and he gives voice to the horrible people who encouraged the beating. So we're really outraged how, you know, how mean people are. Esmeralda is the only one who has enough compassion to give tortured Quasimodo some water, even though Frollo had sent him to kidnap her before. That attempt failed, but she recognized him. And she still has pity on him. Okay, new chapter. A handsome captain. His name is Phoebus. He has a rendezvous with Esmeralda. Women fall in love with him all the time because he is so handsome. Esmeralda has been totally smitten with him for a long time. Whereas Phoebus, eh, he just wants to have fun. He is on his way to the hotel where they are meeting when he realizes that he is being followed. And the man following him is Frollo. Frollo is also madly in love with Esmeralda, and he has sent Quasimodo to kidnap her before, right? Now, Frollo bribes the captain to be able to observe their rendezvous. Yes, he just wants to look, he says. And Phoebus, always tight on funds and not a man of principles really, takes the bribe. The more the novel progresses, the more we realize just how strange Frollo is. He is a priest. He is supposed to be celibate. We learned that when Frollo was younger, other priests would come to him for advice on how to bridle their libido because he was so good at it. Well, Frollo is now pursuing Esmeralda, I suppose he could have given up his priesthood and marry her, you know, just be a friend about it. But instead, he goes a darker route. He wants her kidnapped. He wants to watch her while on a rendezvous with another man. Yeah, Frollo is in full creep mode. So the way the rendezvous goes down is that Esmeralda resists Phoebus at first, she talks to him about marriage and how wonderful it's going to be when they get married. And But Phoebus says, hey, you must not love me that much if you want me to wait. 
I guess a few women have heard that line before. <laughs> and she is about to give in when Frollo barges in, stabs Phoebus, and then flees. Esmeralda faints and wakes up when surrounded by lawmen. She is brought before the judge, and the proceedings are such that Victor Hugo points out all of the flaws of the justice system yet again. She is accused of being a foreign witch, and Esmeralda admits that she is indeed a foreigner. And just like that, she is found guilty with no evidence whatsoever and condemned to death. This is where we learn about Esmeralda's despair, her cruel detention. She is thrown in a damp cellar without a blanket. She suffers from delirium and hypothermia. But using his position as a priest, Frollo comes to visit her. And at first, she doesn't recognize him. She begs him to take her away from this awful tomb. Then he reveals his face and she recognizes the strange man who has been following her around and who stabbed Phoebus. He offers to take her away from this misery and declares his love to her, but she would rather die here than go anywhere with him. She curses him. He is crushed and leaves her in the jail. The next day, Esmeralda is led to the small plaza in front of Notre Dame to be presented to the public before she is led to the Place de Grève to be executed. Place de Grève is, well, it used to be where City Hall is today, so not very far from Notre Dame. This is where for centuries people were brought to be burned alive or tortured to death or whatever other awful and pleasant trees were common back then. Esmeralda is in full despair. She thinks she sees Phoebus at one of the windows. Suddenly, Quasimodo jumps down on a rope from the Gallery of Kings and swoops to grab Esmeralda. He takes her in the air with him and yells, Asile! Asile! That means asylum. And the crowd cheers him on. Quasimodo can finally show off his skills to everyone. He swings from rope to rope, taking her higher and higher on the cathedral. He is strong, he has Esmeralda in his arms, and the people are astounded by this feat. Esmeralda is now under the care of Quasimodo inside of Notre Dame, where she got asylum. She has a tiny room with a small window from which she can see the cloister. Now, don't go looking for the cloister next to Notre Dame. It isn't there anymore. Esmeralda is safe there because the authorities have no hold on her thanks to the rules of asylum. But she still loves Phoebus, and she refuses to believe that he is dead. Frollo is also still in love with Esmeralda, and now he can see her window from his room in the cloister. Asylum was a really important part of French law and customs between the Middle Ages and Louis XII. The justice system was so fatally flawed and unfair that asylum was seen as a counterbalance mechanism. But asylum was also deeply flawed because murderers and the innocent alike, took advantage of it. Any royal palace, princely residence, or church were places where you could go ask for asylum. Sometimes, where there was a need to attract new population to a city, the whole city was declared to be an asylum city for a time. Louis XI turned Paris, the whole city, into an asylum city in 1467. Once within the asylum zone, the criminal could not be touched. But as soon as they left, they could be captured to go back into the hands of justice. So when you go to Notre Dame, look for the ring of asylum. It's on the door where you exit the cathedral. I'll put a picture of it on the show notes for this episode so you can see it. But once you had the ring of asylum in hand, you were safe from the law. Frollo was going mad. 
He stopped going out of his room, from which he can observe Esmeralda. And he sees Quasimodo visit her in the room and how she talks to him. In Frollo's wild imagination, Esmeralda is in love with Quasimodo. And she has somehow betrayed him once more. Remember, he, he felt like she betrayed him with Phoebus and now with Quasimodo. Frollo broke into Esmeralda's room and again tried to convince her to love him. She refuses again. He presses her and he tries to physically overcome her. But Quasimodo gave Esmeralda a whistle to use to call him. It's one of the few sounds that he can hear. When he hears the whistle, Quasimodo rushes to Esmeralda's room, knife in hand, and he finds a man on top of her. As Quasimodo drags the intruder out of the room, there's more light and he's able to recognize Frollo. Shocked that he almost killed his adoptive father, he gives Frollo the knife and offers him his life. But Esmeralda grabs the knife, is ready to kill Frollo, and Frollo runs off, swearing that nobody will ever have Esmeralda. Clopin, he brings his army to Notre Dame to remove Esmeralda because he heard that Frollo will go back on his obligation of asylum and will relinquish her to the authorities. Again, in this instance, the priest is not true to his word, but the thieves fulfill their obligation to their sister, Esmeralda. From the top of the cathedral, Quasimodo sees what's happening, and he starts defending his church by using construction material that was stored uh, near the roof. He starts throwing all sorts of things on the robbers. He even starts a fire and melts some lead, and he he runs the lead through the gargoyles, which kills a lot of people. This, you know, this is this is a very dramatic. And this is where we learn that the roof structure at Notre Dame is called the forest, la forêt, because it's got so many beams and so much wood in there. And that's still the name it has today. So this is an epic fight, right, that ensues. Uh, it opposes Quasimodo to all of the robbers. Quasimodo shines. He kills dozens. But eventually the robbers manage to break the door of the cathedral, enter and rob the place. They came for Esmeralda, but seeing the treasure inside the cathedral, they get distracted, right? And then the king's soldiers, including Phoebus, who we thought was dead, come to chase the robbers away from Notre Dame. So now Quasimodo is free to abandon his fighting post, and he goes to find Esmeralda. Her room is empty. He searches for her and finds Frollo instead. Frollo is deep in thought and pays no attention to anything else. Then Quasimodo remembers that the only person besides himself that has the key to get to Esmeralda's room is Frollo. Frollo is looking towards the Place de Grève, where a hanging is about to take place. Both Quasimodo and Frollo watch and Quasimodo realizes in horror that they are hanging Esmeralda. As she's dying, Frollo bursts out in an evil laugh that Quasimodo cannot hear, but he sees it on his face. Quasimodo rushes towards Frollo and pushes him off the Tower of Notre Dame. And there it's very dramatic. Uh, Frollo hangs on for a long time. The father and the son exchange terrible looks. Frollo clearly wants to live, but Quasimodo, in tears, will not help him. Frollo takes forever to fall, <laughs> but eventually he falls. And his body bounces off various parts of the cathedral. It's, it's all described in gruesome detail. And he dies on the ground below. Quasimodo disappeared from the cathedral the day Frollo and Esmeralda died. Esmeralda's body is taken to an open mass grave. Two years later, when they go looking for the body of a man that the king didn't think deserved to be left in the mass grave, they find 
the mostly decayed bodies of Esmeralda and Quasimodo holding one another tightly. And when they tried to move him away from her, his body fell to dust. I mean, how's that for a dramatic ending? <laughs> so, to, to conclude, I'm the kind of person who can spend a couple of hours inside of a cathedral and be content looking around at the stained glass, the candlelight, the statuary. I try to piece together Bible stories and I wonder what all happened in there. You know, it's been there 850 years. It's a long, it's been there a long time. But it wasn't always so. I remember getting really impatient in church as a child, even as an adult. I remember walking in a church thinking, you know, this feels really un unfamiliar and uncomfortable and walking out almost immediately. But it really doesn't have to be so. When you're at Notre Dame next time, think about both the wonderful stories that the cathedral tells in stone and also about the wonderful stories that other people have told that take place at Notre Dame, such as this gripping story of the Hunchback of Notre Dame. Thank you, Colleen Phelan, for your pledge to support the show on Patreon this week. A lot of new things are happening for patrons, such as yourself, Colleen. So listen up, Patreon supporters. I, th I think you are going to like it. Patrons now have access to two rewards per month. You get Lunch Break French. That's the advanced French audio where I write an article in French and I translate it into English. And I read it to you in French first. And then I read it in French and English line by line. It's really good for those of you who are learning French and trying to develop your listening comprehension skills. And new, starting this month, you also get one installment of the French History Brief, where I tell you about one aspect of French history that I've researched. That's going to be in English only. I will be releasing that in the next couple of days. And the third new thing for Patreon supporters is that you now get your own private RSS feed that lets you subscribe to Lunch Break French and the French History Brief with your podcast app on your phone. So Patreon sent you instructions on how to do that. You should have gotten it in your email box. If you missed it and need help, let me know. Annie at joinusinfrance.com. It's really easy to do. And it's wonderful because once you do that, it's, it's exactly the same idea as subscribing to a podcast, right? But it's a private feed for patrons only to say thank you for your support. So once you subscribe to your exclusive Patreon feed, Lunch Break French and the French History Brief will appear automatically on your phone or your tablet and you can listen on demand. You get all of this for your donation of $5 a month. I hope you get great satisfaction when you see that you're helping the show continue and also help your next trip to France be even better than the last one. So thank you, patrons. And also thank you, Jessica Bell, for tipping your guide. Sending in a one-time tip is also much appreciated. If you get value from the show and you want to say thank you, visit joinusinfrance.com forward slash support to see what you can do to give back. Next week on the podcast, I'll release a short episode about the Axe Historique de Paris. So it's the, it's kind of a historical axis of Paris. I'll explain it next week. It's kind of interesting. Also, it's possible you heard my dog growl and do some heavy breathing during the recording of the show she's very old and she's getting very sick and so i i she gets extremely anxious if she's not near me at all times so i apologize about that but it's what you do when you love a dog and they get old au revoir i'll talk to you next week the Join Us in France Travel Podcast is written and produced by Annie Sargent and copyright 2017 by Addicted to France. It is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. <laughs>